Well, welcome to our new series for January 2022, A Church on Fire. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at Acts and seeing what happened in the early church. So let's start with our reading from Acts chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. After his suffering, that is Jesus, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning that we come to you with empty hands. But we know as we pray in confidence that you will be with us and that you will fill our hands with your Holy Spirit. So, Father, we just pray, come, come, and be with us. Amen. Right. Any idea on what the force was that made that book leave my hand and land on the ground? Oh, well done. That's excellent. Have you any ideas who it was that actually formulated the theory on gravity. Yes, you're right, Newton was the one. And this was quite a while ago, so I wonder if you can remember how long ago it was that Newton worked on that theory. It was, gosh, we have got some really clever people. I can see we've got a whole row of scientists here. So I think things are looking very good. So let's see how you get on with the next question. Here we are, and we're rubbing these together. What force is being created here? Well done, yeah, friction. It makes things feel warmer, and of course, in days gone by, they would use this method to start fires. So friction, there was somebody who did quite a lot of work on friction, and he's pretty much, it's, a, it's, it's a definitely a he, he's pretty much the person that we associate with that work on friction. It was quite a while ago. Any ideas? I know we've got the clever lot over here. Let's see. I think we need your help. Well done. Gosh, this is incredible, isn't it, folks? Leonardo da Vinci, that's right. It was great at painting pictures, but he's also a scientist. Any idea how long ago it was that Leonardo did his work on friction? It was 500 years ago. My goodness, I'm, I am so, so impressed. To be honest, I had to look that up. So well done to people who knew it straight away. Right, now we've got our final one. And you have to pardon me for a minute. I don't normally go around licking pieces of plastic, but sometimes needs must. So here we go. Are we all ready? One, two, three, and oh dear. I'll try it again. You know, it's funny, it normally works first time. Let's have another look. You can see him with his little eye there. And so we press this down. Press this down. I'm trying to do it with the microphone, it's not the easiest thing. And, well, the, the idea behind it, folks, is that it pops out. You can see there the spring, and it pops up. Any ideas on the name of the force? This is a tricky one, isn't it? Well, actually, it's called elastic potential energy. And the person that um, discovered this was a chap called Rankin, and that was about 170 years ago. So all of these um, different um, scientists, we've only found the information over the last 500 years. And we might not understand what all this is about because we might think to ourselves, I'm not a scientist, but I believe what this scientist is saying because I can see the effects 
I can see what's happening. And therefore, I trust that scientist and think, yeah, they know what they're talking about. But the interesting thing is, we can't see the force at work. We can't see the gravity. We don't see the friction. And this one, unfortunately, you didn't actually see how it works. But when it springs up, we wouldn't have seen the force behind it. We'd have seen the spring move, but not the actual force. And even though we couldn't see those forces, and even though people didn't really start to discover them, and, except for the last 500 years, the point is that those forces have existed since the beginning of time. The fact that we didn't know about them is irrelevant. The point is that all through time, these forces have been there, and we finally, in the last 500 years, began to recognize them. Well, when we've got our reading here today, what we are seeing in it is that Jesus is talking about a force. But this isn't a force um, in the way that we've been looking at. This is a spiritual force. And again, like the other forces we've talked about, we can't actually see it. It's not here in the room. We can't see a spiritual force going around. But we see the effects of it. And the effects on our lives over these years have just been so dramatic. So let's have a look at this together. And when we looked at verse 3, it says here, to, the, to these he, that's Jesus, also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. And he was speaking of things regarding the kingdom of God. Jesus showed the evidence for this spiritual force by facts. Because it says here that over 40 days, he talked about many convincing proofs. But he also, just like the scientists, it's interesting, because when we have scientists, what they do is their work isn't credited unless they produce a paper. And in the paper, what they do is they describe how they went about the experiment and all the results. And it's only when it's compared um, and looked at by peers that people say, well, actually, this is a, a genuine discovery. They won't do it unless we have a written paper discussing exactly how it came about. And here, we're talking about a spiritual force, but this has a paper, because just like the scientist, Luke records the evidence. Really, really interesting that that's happened, isn't it? Jesus carefully, over 40 days, explained the evidence so that the disciples were in no no ideas at all that they could get it wrong. They knew that this had happened. It said convincing proofs. But we can picture there, and I love the sight of it, that you've got all these disciples and maybe they're sat outside on a hillside and Jesus is telling them all these stories about all these convincing proofs. And they're all there and they're thinking, wow, isn't that absolutely amazing? I'm going to go away and I'm going to tell my family about this or I'm going to tell my friends about it. And they must have been 40 glorious, glorious days. But what makes me smile about it is that on the final day, Jesus started to turn the tables because he said, you've been listening to all this for, for so long, but now I want you to get involved. So let's just look at this um, reading together. This is verses four and five. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. This is a big statement because what had happened is even though the disciples knew that Jesus had risen from the dead, it's clear in the scriptures that they went back to work. Although they'd seen, although their faith had been built up, they were still in a place where they thought, I'm going to stay in my comfort zone. I'm not going to do anything different. And for all of us, I suspect at times, we have comfort zones that when things are becoming unfamiliar, when we're not sure about it, we can pull back. But that is not such a thing that I'm trying to lay on people today and for us to say, well, I failed and that's the end of it. Because as I prayed at the beginning, we come with empty hands. We admit today that there are areas where we can 
be closer to you, where we can where we can see more of what you're doing in our lives. So let's just look at that together. Those people had listened and it was and they knew about the resurrection, but they went away and they went back to their familiar ways. But the wonderful thing was that Jesus didn't leave them there. He said he commanded them, this was the second time then if you think about it, to stay and wait for what the Father had promised. So he did not give up on them. And if we make a mistake, God keeps knocking, he keeps trying with us so that we can get to that place with him that he wants us to be. And he said that this is one that you, you heard from me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So there we have it. It wasn't just going to be Jesus that did the work, but the Holy Spirit. And there is a clear link here between faith and obedience. Because we can have an obedience to scriptures in which we say, oh, this is what God wants people to do, so we'll just go out and do it. But what I would say there is that we are trying to do God's work in human ways. And to be honest, it will bear very little fruit. What Jesus is looking for, first of all, is that our faith rises. That means that he reveals things to us in such a way that we can see what he wants to do and we believe him. And as we believe him, we obey. And again, that's another area where we can fall short because we can go away from church and we can think, do you know what? I've had a great time. I've listened to the sermon. I've sung lots of lovely songs, but I'm just going to go now back to the old life I had before. It will make no difference to my life. And so the challenge for each one of us this morning Will it make a difference when we have a real sense of what God's doing, when we have real faith for what God's got planned for St. Hostel, for our church? Are we going to be obedient or are we going to go straight back to what we were doing before? Now, the words that Jesus chose on that day were words that would have really made the people think because we just read... Um, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And for people like myself, when I was growing up, I was brought up with um, the word Holy Ghost as a description of the Holy Spirit rather than Holy Spirit. And as a child, I just didn't get it. And I sort of imagined this whimsical sort of ghost floating around. And I just couldn't see how this was going to all work. And it seemed such a strange thing. But what happened here was those people that were listening wouldn't have just heard Holy Spirit, but they would have heard the Greek word that had a very different meaning to what we would expect. Does, the word was dunamis. Does anybody here have an idea what that Greek word dunamis means in English today? There must be somebody here. Dynamite, that's right. What happened was, uh, the reason we've got the name dynamite in our vocabulary is because the Swedish um, chemist and engineer, Alfred Nobel, when he was working in the 1800s on his new invention, which was explosive power, he spoke to a friend and he said, what is the Greek word for an explosive power? And the word was dunamis. And what Jesus said here is, you will be baptized with dunamis. Well, for goodness sake, an explosive power rather than water. I can understand why the disciples would have been listening to this part and thinking, oh my goodness. It was one thing listening to Jesus, but the idea that we are going to be involved as well, that is serious stuff. Because when we look at this explosive dunamis, what Jesus was saying here and what many of us have experienced is a complete change within our lives. Because we were going in one direction and as the Holy Spirit has worked on our life, we've suddenly found ourselves doing something totally, totally different. If somebody told me when I was a young person I would be stood here now like this, 
I would not have believed it. I thought church was irrelevant. But my goodness, when you have a sense of what the Holy Spirit can do, you just know that anything is possible. So what does being baptized in the Holy Spirit mean to us? Well, what it means is that a member of the Godhead comes to live in us. And that is just absolutely mind-blowing. Even though I have known the presence of the Holy Spirit for over 40 years, I still can't get my head around it because it is just such a wonderful, amazing, undeserved place to be. And we would probably wonder and think to ourselves, why did the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 come as a wind and fire? Well, part of this would have been fully understood by the audience. We all know that the people that were gathered that day had come for the Passover, so they would have been the Jews. And it, the fact that it was a wind would not have been um, lost on them because the word for wind and the word for spirit in Hebrew is the same word, which is ruah. It sounds beautiful, that word, doesn't it? You can almost hear the breath in it, ruah. And when we think about that wind, what we, what we know is that that ruah is actually the breath of God. So when we look at Acts 2 and we see this mighty wind, it is not just a wind like we would see it on the coast here. And for goodness sake, it can get pretty windy, can't it, sometimes? This was the breath of God blowing through that place. This was the source of life because each one of us cannot live without breath. And we sing that beautiful song, don't we? It's your breath in our lungs. So we call out your praise. And that is what God promises us. As we are baptized in the Spirit, his breath is in our lungs, that source of life, because that wind is the breath of God. And then the fire. Well, fire is an interesting one. As we know, it came and separated on each of the people in that room. And what the fire reminds us first of all of, and again, this would not be left on the Jewish hearers, was the presence of God. When the fire was there, we, ha we know that there is a presence of God. And that was, we had the breath of God and the presence of God. And this is such a beautiful, beautiful thing because the Jewish people would, right from Abraham, and I don't want to go into it all now because it would take a, a full sermon, but right from that first covenant where God came and he came like a fire through the sacrifice that Abraham had left and he made a covenant. And then we had, of course, on the Mount Sinai where people knew that Moses was speaking to God because of the fire on the top of the mountain. And when we have that sense of the Holy Spirit, that knowledge of the Holy Spirit within us, we have God's presence in our life. It might not look like a fire, but as it burns within us, it is a fire. And with that fire of the passion of what God can do with us, anything is possible. But the fire also brings illumination. And that is so, so important because, you know, I've been a Christian for over 40 years and I still look at something in the Bible and suddenly the Holy Spirit will illuminate and I'll see not only how it fits into that particular passage, but I'll see how it fits into the rest of his word. And I'll just think, wow, why didn't I see that before? But it's because the Holy Spirit illumines it. Sometimes we can be talking to someone and there again, the Holy Spirit shows us something about that person and we can help them and be in a place where we can journey with them. The Holy Spirit brings illumination into our lives. But there also is a bit of a danger warning here. And this one was certainly something that people who prayed for a revival would echo. And that is that when the Holy Spirit moves like a fire, we can't contain it. We can't decide what we want the Holy Spirit to do because just like fire sweeps through, the Holy Spirit will sweep through situations and we have just got to follow. We've just got to be obedient and trust in what he's doing because he may not do it the way we want him to, 
But the way he does it will be right. The way he does it will be so wonderful that we see it and we say, wow, this is God's work and it's marvellous in our eyes. But it also, the fire brings warmth. And there's a, very, a story which many of you will have heard before, and I'm not going to repeat the whole thing now, but John Wesley, he had spent so much time seeking. And all the time he was seeking, he knew he was missing something. He knew that there was something more from God that he didn't have. And sometimes we can go through times like that. For John Wesley, it meant traveling many miles overseas, still searching. And you might feel this morning that you've been searching for a long time and you know that God's got more for you. And the wonderful answer is, he does. Just keep hanging on in there, keep praying, because in his perfect time, he will show you. And what happened was he traveled all around in different places, came back to London, and it says that in a prayer meeting, his heart was strangely warmed. And the warmth that he felt is a warmth that many of us have felt in our hearts. Our hearts have been warmed too, because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He does these great dynamic things. But when we look at the gifts of the Spirit, the main gift that the Spirit brings to us is love. And that love will be shed abroad to others. That love is, when we talked about the scientists earlier, is the effect that people will mainly see. Because as we show love for each other, as it says in the scriptures, by this all men will know that you're my disciples because you have love for each other. And as we show love for others, that is one of the most powerful forces in this world. And so do not despise those things and do not think to oneself, do you know what, I just want to see the powerful things. I just want to see the exciting things. The fact that the Holy Spirit is birthing love in our hearts is so important. And as we close, I'd just like to remind you of a few things. And that is that this love that God has for you, the way that he will move through, the Holy, the Holy Spirit will move through your life, will not be because you've had a wonderful education. Education's great and pouring over God's word is wonderful. It's, it's inspiring. But education itself is not what God's looking for. You know, as he said to David, he looks on the heart. And it isn't training. Yeah, there's some great training programs, Freedom in Christ that we were talking about earlier. Really excellent. But the Holy Spirit is not looking for you to succeed and get a lot of qualifications. He can use you here and he can use you now. And yes, some of us have been a Christians a very long time. And you might think, oh, well, I've not been a Christian very long. I'm not, I'm, I don't think I'd be very good at all this. No, folks. If the Holy Spirit wants to use you, even if you became a Christian today, this very morning, God can use you. The single greatest thing that we have is the love that Jesus puts in our heart, that relationship with him, because through that, all things are possible. Through that, we get a hunger to get to know him better. Through that, we want to be obedient. That is the secret to all these things, is the Holy Spirit bringing love into our hearts, bringing that warmth that we talked about the fire. And so as we leave, I just want to leave a thought with you. You know, in my job, in my calling, I have to do numerous funerals. And I know that some of the people who sit and look on at the coffin would look and say, I wish I hadn't taken that person for granted. I didn't realize what a big hole there would be in my life after they've gone. And I would say it's the same for many of us sometimes. We maybe look at family members or friends and think, you know, I do take them a bit for granted. I don't really realize how precious they are to me. And I would say it's the same with the Holy Spirit. We can become so familiar with his presence. We can be so familiar with the fact that he's answering our prayers that we don't take seriously the fact that he's dynamite, the fact that he can do anything, anything in us, anything through us. And if at this point in time we are wanting to move forward in the things of God, 
We need to open our eyes and we really need to see what God is going to do through us by his Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we are so sorry for the times that we take his presence for granted. Give us a new understanding of what it is to have the part of the Godhead living within us. Lord, build up our faith. Let us be obedient and let us move forward with you as individuals, as families, and as a church. Amen. Himself is paid the price that all who trust in Him today find healing in His sacrifice.
the truth that I'm significant, you know, I'm worth something. The freedom in Christ experience brought those truths to life. It's more than material, it's more than a seminar, it's more than just one discipleship group. It really is a lifestyle of embracing freedom on a regular basis. In proclaiming the Word of God and I've been on the streets talking to people, um, leading people to Christ and it's, it's just been amazing. Well, welcome to Freedom in Christ. The purpose of this course is to help you live as the person God created you to be and do all the things he's prepared in advance for you to do. Have you ever put on one of these? It's a virtual reality headset. And the idea is that... Today we're going to be looking at the world's view of truth. We're going to be talking about choosing to believe what God says is true. Who sets you free is God. What sets you free is your response to Him and repentance and faith. So we're going to have this great privilege. Being accepted and being significant being secure. This course is the best decision I've, I've made. I'm, I'm a new person. I do it. It's, it's changed me completely. Uh, it's just truth. Truth is what you get out of it. Your eyes will be open. <laughs> grace how sweet the sound I once was lost but now I'm found I once was blind but now I see I was a slave to sin but now I'm free <laughs> that's right